Hey, welcome, welcome, friends, comrades, beloveds. We are so excited that you are able to join us this evening. My name um, is Erica Foreman, and I am a publicist for the Breakbeat Poet Series for Haymarket Books. I get the esteemed, distinct pleasure of joining you in celebration of Miss Cheryl Boyce Taylor's newest collection, Mama Fife Represents. It's a tribute to Fife's life and legacy and Cheryl's incredible journey after the loss of her beloved son. It was no surprise to me that Malik was raised in the love of a poet. A tribe called Quest impact is undeniable, spanning generations and global reach. It shaped the hip hop heads in us, the reasons why the music speaks to our struggle and triumph and epically our love for one another. I feel lucky and blessed to witness this meeting of minds in admiration between Cheryl and Hanif Abdurraqib, both poets who speak clearly from the heart and have the craft chops to make their contributions to this poetry landscape crystalline. It's in all of our best interest to listen very closely to the jewels they have to give us. As you can see in the chat, following the discussion, Cheryl will um, share some poems from her collection and we'll have a brief Q&A from the audience. So make sure you send us your questions, post them in the chat. Um, if you have um, besides the questions, if you have any best ways to uh, sort of interact with one another, I want to make sure that we big up the room with much love for Cheryl. This is, again, an incredible book, and I know she's so excited um, to put it out into the world. Most importantly, because this book is so dope, if you have not gotten it yet, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> get, get it immediately. You are already late. You can holler at the purchase link through Haymarket Books, which is also in the chat. Um, and while the event itself, of course, is always free, which is why we stream it live for you here accessibly on our Haymarket Books channel, if you're feeling led in any way to throw a donation um, in the pot, I'm sure not only Haymarket, but the poets would be much obliged. So thank you so much for that, because we take care of us. Um, and I want to give a quick special shout out to our captioner, Miss Amanda Lundberg. Um, who's making this event more accessible, um, which is great. And we so appreciate your support in those endeavors. So thank you so much, Amanda. Um, after this little brief introduction, you get a special treat of seeing a presentation, uh, which is some footage of Fife uh, from a live performance in the Bowery on Mother's Day, I believe, uh, that he did a live event with Cheryl. But this part has not necessarily been seen as widely with the public. So we're going to share that with you, and then we're going to jump straight into the conversation with Hanif and Cheryl. So without further ado, please take it away. Let's build. This is a new song from the upcoming solo album. This is called Diggy Dialect. It's pretty much a Calypso vibe going on, representing Trinidad and Tobago every day, all day. Red, black, and white. All my Jamaican posse, all my Beijers, everybody, every West City, you know I'm coming from. Thug for life, we roll deep in the club all night. Maybe my this mic is not me. This is how we live our lives. Our boys and boys in five. Yeah, now we're really going thug for life. We roll deep in the club all night. This is how we live our lives. Yeah, listen, listen to me. Dickie be an attitude for partying. Guarantee tomorrow night we buck again. Make sure you tell your friend to tell another friend. What about drinks? You better call Ted Lang and them. Some of 2K traders be the anthem. From that legend who be short, dark, and handsome. I got that good stuff, Ma. You think you want some? No, girl, I get broke. Yes, yeah, send that some. Me, Keon, done. If you can handle, let that monkey know. And don't talk about taking slow, cause you done know. More action, less talk is what I mean, I do. I'm quite adamant on what it was I came to do. So what I hear, you know, your pocket simply behind the lips. And if I say so myself, I keep it adequate. The question here, baby girl, is can you manage this? Diggy dog, soccer boy, don't let me down the shit. You all about time. Man, I really got tough for life. We roll deep and out of club all night. This is how we live our lives. Oh, God, let's fight. But give me one more verse of this. Tough for life. Listen, roll deep in the club all night. I said, this is how we live our lives. Listen. Look what up, girl. You see them nice, eh? Me not like two things. She enticed me. She figure look well nice for more than it's all tight for them, but she's smuggling. Check the turn of 16, I'll be bundling. It's all good, but from Frederick to Hollywood. Down from the same spot, it's time it well hot. Watch how me watch him on the back like blood clot. We can't stop, people eat like a whole clot. She 
where they go to do a big shot. They have a shot to boy, could never run with that. You see no skin teeth with the media. Mommy says she wants a long, nice, hot, and fat. Good boy, you don't know how I give she got. Bouncy fat, hooks the bullshit out of Canada. As for this one, you know I'll never get you that, but don't tell my wife you that. <laughs> For a in the club all night, this is how we live our lives. Oh, God, it's fine. You're like the first one to hear this record right here. Yeah. I exclusively did it for my mom. All right? Yeah. How y'all like that? Thank you so much for uh, that, and I want to say that it's an it's an honor to be here, and I'm really thrilled and just outright pleased to be here. Not only in honor of this book, but um, in honor of the ways that grief can be celebratory and not just overwhelmed with sadness in the way that um, you know our emotions can be more than one thing. But uh, also, Miss Cheryl Boyce Taylor, it's just an honor to get to talk to you as like from poet to poet because I, I feel like my first introduction to your work was kind of just like sitting on the floor in the back of the New York and sometime years and years ago and and first hearing the sound of your poems and so it's just a joy to be here and thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited this evening. I'm having a hard time breathing. <laughs> no, but Mighty, mighty thanks to you, Hannah, for being here. I'd also like to thank, thank the Breakbeat Poet series, my Haymarket family, especially Maya, Erica, and Kevin. I want to call everybody's name, but it will take up all my reading time, and I know you want to hear some poems. I'd also like to thank um, my family, Walt, Disha, Sini and my friend Donna, family, friends, and everyone who interviewed me, supported this book in some way, listened to poems. I thank you so very much for helping me to bring this new baby into the world. Most of all, though, I want to thank my mother, Eugenia Boyce, who really introduced myself and Malik to poetry. And this would not be possible without Malik, Fife Dog Taylor. I love you wherever you are. Listen to the sound of my voice. This is mommy speaking. So um, let's take it away. Yeah. I Before I wanted to get into the kind of emotional aspects of the book. I am just such a fan of you on a craft level um, because of how, uh, and I know you've talked about this in interviews before about, about your use of dialect and how the musicality in the language flows. And I think that there's one constant thread in all your poems, in, in all the books of yours that I've read, and I think it runs from Arrival to this one, where no matter what you're doing thematically, you're not sacrificing the pleasures of sound in your in your work in your work in the language you choose. Is that something you're kind of doing consciously, or you have do you have like a a soundtrack playing in your head as you write, or how do you arrive from a craft level at the kind of music that that bounces off the page? Well, I would say first of all, I come from a very musical country. There was music in everything, everywhere. But like I said to someone recently, I never invite Trinidad to come into my work. But every time I sit down to write, there she is, say this, say that. You know, it's just in my blood, I guess. And um, it's one of the ways I keep home close to me, especially in rough times. Well, actually, all the time. It is how I keep Trinidad in my head by the, the sound of music, calypso, steel pan. They all somehow ring together when I sit down to write. So it's not even conscious. Sometimes I say, well, did I invite you? I come <laughs> up with all this dialect in my work, but that I love it. And I'm committed to 
letting people hear how I sound, how my family sounds in their home, how what my father sounded like in his yard, my grandmother. So um, it is definitely the way I keep culture alive, language through language. This is also a, a great day for us to be talking in part because, you know, it's Zora Neale Hurston's birthday, and she is someone who I think about as. Um, a writer who really showed a path for me early on what language could do and what dialogue could do within the work. And I, I think so often about how um, among our folks, among the poets in our, among the living poets we know, particularly in, in New York and the East Coast, you know, you're someone who has kind of um, passed on your good fortunes of, of mentorship and, and that kind of thing. I know you, you studied under Audre Lorde and you know, now you're kind of someone who I think a lot of my peers say, you know, like I learned a lot from from the Cheryl Boyce Taylor or, you know, I was mentored by this work. How how much responsibility do you feel to kind of pass on or to sit in a lineage with, with other writers and not just kind of, you know, you're at a point now where you could just write your books and not be bothered by anything or anyone. Um, but there's a generosity to your spirit that I think lives beyond the work. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how important that is to you to, to, to push that out just as much as pushing the, the poems out. That is very important. I think from the very beginning of my writing experience, well, what, I grew up in Queens and it was a small writing community. But the one thing I, I said, there were three things I said I would do. I would always continue to write. I will always write in dialect and I would always make community through literature mainly poetry, because that's, that's the thing I love the most. And so I feel like I also had the support of Audre Lorde. I studied with June Jordan, Cheryl Clark, I, and, and Tezaki Shange. I just felt that I was so lucky to be around and have that, that wealth of poets with language and love and the life of a woman. I was so lucky to have that. <clears throat> that I wanted to always pass that on. So that is something really important to me. I will always do that along with my writing. To, to hit on this book, which I adore a great deal, a big a general question that I, I know this is like a generic one, but how are you feeling now that it's, you know, it's no longer, I, I feel like I ask writers this a lot when their books enter the world, the general, like, how are you feeling that your books entering in the world? But this feels like a specific special case of that question because um, this is more than just like a text that's entering the world, right? It's it's a, a part of your self and your history that is not that distant and it involves a person who the world knew in a different way or, or a slightly different way than you did, at least. And so I, when I ask how you're feeling, I think I'm asking it um, with all of those things tucked underneath it. Well, I feel great excitement. I feel a lot of fear because I've given away so much of my heart in writing this book. But I needed to write this book because I didn't, somewhere in my, in my early days of grieving, I thought that I would forget who my son was. I, you know, I'm a therapist. I know that we grieve in different ways, but that was my biggest fear. And I was forgetting a lot of things. So I, I said, I, I'm gonna have to write this now because I cannot forget this. And, and I really wanted the fans and, you know, poets, writers, whatever, I wanted them to know who Malik was because everyone had an idea about who Fife was. I wanted people to know who this little boy was and how did he grow into this man who was so brave and strong and vulnerable and loving and just the other half of my heart. So I'm excited, I'm a little bit scared. Um, you know, I, I had to speak to my daughter-in-law and I spoke to his dad about certain things that were in the book because he, Malik didn't just belong to me, you know, he, he had a wife and so I wanted to make sure that I wasn't telling too many secrets out of the home and what was comfortable for them and I still ended up writing what I wanted to write but I, I, I needed to share some of that with them. So um, it's with great excitement I, sh I share this book. 
and and some heartbreak too, because I'm still missing him like crazy. Um, I've been thinking a lot about memory. I mean, I often think about the idea of memory as as a as a privilege and. Um, not just the ability to hold on to memory, but the ability to have relationship with memory that feels fulfilling. I, um, I mean, we I talked we talked about this a bit when we last when we were last aligned with each other in person. Then, um, you know, when I lost my mother when I was young, when I was thirteen, and I am at a point now, decades later, a little over two decades later, um, where I'm I am forgetting sometimes the sound of my mother's voice, right? Um, I can't remember my mother's voice sound. Like, I can't remember her laugh. I can remember, it, but and there's a real grief in that, right? Or there's real, um, and I'm mostly interested in your in your urgency to kind of create this book as a as a mode of kind of storing memory or archiving. Um, were there several small heartbreaks in the in the like forgetting and then remembering again, or remembering and then forgetting again, or was it all kind of joy bringing? to get that on the page? Oh, lots of heartbreak in, in forgetting things. I, I, um, I think about two weeks after the, the, uh, uh, his burial service, I turned to my partner and I said to her, was my brother at the service? You know, I would ask questions like that because I couldn't remember, you know. And so that scared me. And um, actually, well, Malik passed away in March, and I began going to therapy somewhere in September. But I started going because as that year was close to ending, I just had this overwhelming fear that once December leaves and the new year comes in, he'll no longer be with me. I won't remember, I won't remember his voice. I won't remember conversations we had. Of course, that turned out not to be true because I am fortunate, very fortunate as a mother who's lost her son to be able to turn on his music and hear and hear his voice. You know, it's, I'm really fortunate with that. It's one of the things that has helped me. If I forget his speaking voice, I can call his dad's phone because he recorded his dad's outgoing message. So sometimes when I call, and sometimes when I call him, I forget that that message is on there, and I go, oh. But um, I've, it, it's I, I did have that big fear that I would forget him, and now I know, no, you won't. He won't let you forget him. You know, he's always around, always near me, and and I feel really grateful for that. I'm also. Um you know, if there is if there is one thing that uh, Malik and I had in common is that we're both sons of mothers who are writers, and um, I, I mean, I talked about this in my book, and again, we talked about this in person. What I was most excited about when kind of doing the parallels of of listening to his rhymes and reading your work is that it's that you can see that bridge there really easily, um, and it, maybe not thematically, but but again, sonically and linguistically, did you ever listen to his music early on and say, oh, I see what he's doing. Like, this is something that he pulled from me. He's pulling some tricks from me. Or this well, is something he, you in the house. <laughs> he would tell me. He would say, listen to this. What does that sound like? You know, he, he was very much into the dialect. And so, or sometimes he'd call up and say, how do you say this? Or how do you say that word? Or, I'm remembering grandma said it like this. You say it like that, which is the right way. So he had a lot of conversation with me about his work. And the good thing was that um, from the beginning, we said we would not censor each other's work. So whatever he wanted to write about, it was okay. And it was the same with me, which was surprising because sometimes he thought he was my father. But <laughs> funny enough, when it came to my writing, he did not say, Ma, I think you should take that out. I don't think that's something good to say. So, so we did have that, but yes, he, he conferred with me quite a bit when it came to dialogue and other, other, other themes as well. He would ask my opinion about it. Yeah, I, I, one thing that I just value so much is being able to see the connections, the interfamilial connections and inspirations in the work, which um, I didn't think they, those didn't really jump to life for me until 
like five years ago when I started working on the, the book and um, revisiting your work and, um, you know, listening to Malik's verses. Um, and you, I, I mean, I, this is a big question maybe, but um, what was it like to love someone who was also beloved by the wider public in a, and again, in a different way, in a way that was that you maybe, of course, understood, but had different access to. And I will say this because like the one thing I really loved, I love so much about this book, but the one thing I loved about this book were um, the kind of memories and stories of Malik's childhood and youth, because um, as a tribe fan who does not have that intimate interaction, right, it deconstructed and in, uh, in kind of demystified um a life and it was kind of like oh yes the you know these these people that we are fans of don't just like arrive fully formed to <laughs> us as you know um and so that was a real um and i would like to talk about the generosity of the book in a bit but I'm, I'm interested in kind of the process of just loving someone who is beloved by a lot a lot of people in a in a different way well, I I think again I f feel so lucky, and because he started in that business at such an early age, so I think we always knew that we were sharing him with the public. But I remember when he first went on tour, he came back from Europe, and and the, we were in the family was saying, "Oh, Fife," and he turned around and he said, "No, don't call me Malik." Fife is when I'm working, it's my stage name. I don't want my family to call me Fife. And so he always stayed open and he always made that separation. He was not that person on stage when he was at home. And I can understand that because I'm the same way. When I'm doing my poetry, I'm a completely different person from when I'm at home with my family. And so, it really, when he passed away, well, we knew that people loved him because strangers would, when, once they found out I was his mom, strangers would tell me how they loved his music or whatever. But when he passed away, the love that we re received from fans and strangers, uh, it really helped to lift us. It really did. Because I can only imagine somebody losing their beloved and people saying all these bad things about them. Oh, my God, that would break my heart even more. But we were very lucky to have people people love love him as much as they did. And um, I was when my, when Arrival came out, which was almost six months after he passed away and I was out reading, people would come up to me weeping. And sometimes they would say, I'm sorry, I don't want to cry. I don't want to make you cry. But, you know, I expected it. I, it. It really didn't offend me. And I said, I'm okay. I'm not crying. But believe me, if I feel like crying, we'll both be weeping. <laughs> <laughs> and they would just look at me and say, sorry, sorry. They apologized a lot. But I think that he was in the business for so long, 25, 30 years, that... Right that became a part of our life. So we knew we had to share him. But there was the part that's Malik that people didn't know, and that is what I wanted to share in the book. Right. This little busybody boy. <laughs> There's, um, I've been thinking a lot about the, the public process of grieving or when grief is made, when the process of grief is made public. And I've also been thinking a lot about how um, oftentimes grief or sadness, get, they get talked about like they are the only part of the emotion when they're kind of like, they're the end color, they're the end primary color and a lot of other colors have to go into them. And sometimes grief comes with gratitude or sadness comes with rage or all of these things. And a real generosity of the book, I think for me, was illuminating this idea that grief does not only have to be something that weighs us down for for the whatever time we've got here without the people we love or miss um and that is something that i i thought i had a grasp on and i still you know every time i, I think yeah i'm like i got a grasp on this but to see it 
articulated through your work felt really renewing for me and understanding that. And um, I am mostly wondering if the process of making this book or the process of memoir in general, this type of memoir, um, helped kind of illuminate for you, or if you didn't need it to be illuminated, that at the end of your grief or in the middle of your grief, there is also a lot of pleasure or a lot of joyful memory or anything like that? Oh, yeah, lots of joyful memories. And um, one, the reason why I put all those anecdotes in the book about his early childhood was because he was so curious. He was like a little man from, from a very early age. <laughs> I mean, a little man. And that used to tickle me so much. But I think every parent probably goes through this when your two-year-old is turning to you and telling you something intelligent. Go, what? Where do you get this? So that period of his life brought me so much joy. Not that the rest of it didn't, but there was like an awe. Like Walt and I couldn't believe that we had made this child that was so had so many good ideas even at a young age. So the, I went back to that so much in the book because that gave me the most joy. It lifted me the most, his early years and all the little things he would say. Like when I asked him to write some, to I, I said, I don't want you to play every day. I want you to stop and write me something. And the first thing he wrote was, there, mom, today I wrote 15 good songs. <laughs> so that kind, of, that kind of personality, that he just made me laugh so much. And so I wanted to go back to those stories. And I wanted to be honest about other challenges. And, you know, I'm still going through the grieving process. Like during the, he he turned 50 last year. And I didn't expect it, but that was so hard for me because shortly after that, I turned 70. And all I could think of, Malik's not here to see me at 70. And those two weeks were so rough. But then, you know, it passed and I was able to bring myself through it and the excitement of the book. So I still have some days when I feel, oh, I cannot make it without him. Why am I here without him? But then I think the, of the work that I have to do, I, I learned that I had to write this book to carry on his work and to share his life. And since he was such a um, public person, I, I thought it was appropriate to share some of, it, some of our personal yeah. family stories. And it has it lifted is, me, yeah. it has helped me heal. It is such a generous project, and I, I mean, I know I've said that a lot, but I really can't say it enough, and uh, I hope everyone watching this who doesn't have it goes to get it, because I think it was just also instructive to me, because of what you just said about how grief is not, um, it's not like a project that you finish, you know? It's not like something that you finish and then put down and then feel magically better. It's kind of an ongoing something that lives inside the body, and so I, I'm, I'm so thankful for the book for its reminder of the many possibilities of how to honor a life that was close to our lives. Um, and this is like a, this is, you know, I feel like I'm asking too many questions and I apologize. Oh, but no, I had, no. Okay. <laughs> I had like a list and I was like, okay, I'm going to only pick the best ones. But now I'm just on a roll and very excited. Um, are you, are you kind of, what is your process, not just for this book, but for books in general? I'm, I'm mostly trying to get at the idea of, have you started on the path of anything else, writing that you feel good about? Or are you someone who, you know, when you have undertaken a project, especially one like this, um, is this just your writing life? And then you can't get into anything else for a long time after? No, I think I'm a little crazy the other way. I have a, I have a new book. <clears throat> I have a new book called We Are Not Wearing Helmets coming from Northwestern in September. But in the meantime, I have a, a group of writers that I write with, and we write like 100 poems a year. So we have so, for this last year, we have so many poems about the pandemic and all of that. We, we just write to heal ourselves. It's a group of nine women, and sometimes they change, but for the most part, 
we have all been writing together for about eight, nine years. And so I'm doing that and I'm working on the collected works. I'm putting that together a bit more slowly, but um, that's four projects right there. So sometimes I'm a little bit crazy, <laughs> but um, I'm retired. And so this is what I was looking forward to retirement for. Yeah. With, um, I'm, this is my only curious thing with putting together the collected works. How are you? I will, I will not be there for a very, very long time, probably. Um, if I'm ever to a point where I'm putting together collected works, I don't think it's going to, you know, but how is it, how is that process? How are you kind of picking through that? How are you, are you doing that yourself or are you like, I don't know, as the, as the author of, as the author of your own collected works, how are you picking out the ones that you feel like are best telling the story of your arc? Um, yes, I think, well, I'm up to six books now and I have selected the poets, the, the poems that gave me the most joy in each book. So maybe there's 10 poems from each book and then there'll be a bunch of new poems. And um, as I write, I, I, I'm sure I will add more. But once I put it together, I'm going to work with, so I'm going to work closely with an editor, someone to say, well, this doesn't feel, but that's a long process. So I'm not even close to there. I'm close to now. I'm just compiling the poems together. And then I know I will have to take about a year with just that project alone. I, with that project, I won't be doing other things, but probably just writing with my writing group, which is called Elma's Heart Circle. And Elma is my mother who introduced me to poetry. Uh, I have one more question, and then I know you wanted to, to read, and I also cannot wait to hear you read. Um, but, uh, and this is maybe a big question that might be boring on the surface, but it's one I'm interested in because you are a writer with a, a, not only a large body of work, but again, who has um, affected and impacted a lot of writers in your life for the good. Um, and Malik was someone who had his own legacy in in some ways you two had a legacy that was intertwined but you are also your own brilliant and impactful artist do you so do you ever think about or do you ever consider um your own legacy and what you would like to leave the world of writing and writers i i don't really think of it as my own legacy what i think of it as is that i'm doing that now I'm engaging writers. I'm getting ready to um, have a, a fund for um, in Malik's name because I want to help younger writers to use whatever they need to use the money for, to buy supplies, to go away for a week to write or whatever. So that, that I will have more information on how that's going to work at the the end of the month. But I guess that's that's one of the legacies I will leave behind. My, I, I will eventually do a writing fund in my name as well as in Malik's. And, um, but the, I, my work is housed at the Schomburg, the Schomburg Library in New York City. So people can find it there and I guess I want to do my work now. I want to encourage young writers. I want to. I've had many reading series, so that's that's how that's how I want to leave my legacy, doing it in the present while I am around to enjoy it too. Because I love watching new writers come in, and then all of a sudden they're blooming and they're winning awards, and I just feel so good about that. So that's my work. Yeah, that was beautiful. Um, I, should we, should we segue to a reading? Uh, I would love to hear some of the, the work in the book and I am, I'm going to get out of the way and, and be a fan in the audience. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. This is so amazing. Um, I've, one thing about the book is it's not a linear book that you start at page one and you go right through and everything follows it really is a collage. And so I'm reading any page that you open on, 
there's something there to stimulate you, to have you question yourself, how you want to pro proceed in the future, what, or have you looked back at your own life and take something with you, or even write something from one of the prompts or, or poems in here. So I'm, I put together a collage piece that I, I will share. The poets come to our house with sage, white candles and Florida water. They bring calla lilies, my son's favorite flower. They bring drums, choras, and shaker rays. We make a joyful noise, form a prayer circle. Ilana leads all in song. We hug each other, a laying on of hands. We howl and pray together. I feel lifted. Hamatan, something close to lightning and sandstorm. Honey, did we remember to turn off the bathroom light? Will you bring my writing pen and paper? Is the door locked? Will everyone leave before sunrise? What day is it? Has the cat been fed? Will I see my son again? Can I? Will you pray with me? I go to Yemaya. Jesse and Eric meets me in Anguilla. We listen to waves lick the sand like an obedient lover. We have fried conch and lukewarm eggnog. At dinner, the mixed drinks are weak. Flies never leave the table. The black and white couple next door talk incessantly. Bragging and talking all night. We laugh in odd places, don't hear a word they're saying. There's dried toast, no milk for cappuccino. We discuss the poems of Aracelis Gamay. Read letters from Frida to Diego. Loved the dialect of Michelle Cliff in Land of Look Behind. In the morning, we search the island for fried bake and bacalao. We look for a wicker frame for my new poem. Night rolls in heavy as sorrow. My twin sons, Malik and Michael, are the butter yellow butterflies who greet me every morning. They walk me to the breakfast shed. Mom, I need a kidney. Will you lay with me? Will you lay with me? Dear mountain, my heart is still not healing. I fill the bathroom with begonias and baby's breath. My bath water is so hot, it makes me weep. Where has my son gone? Why did he leave? I love it when he calls me Mama Fife. On his first walk after transplant surgery, Malik walks to his wife's room. She has given him her kidney. We love our kidney baby. We love Disha. Disha comes home. Malik brings Disha home to meet grandma. She is the apple of his eye. He wants her approval first. When I arrive, they are talking basketball and football. She's a Raiders fan. She is West Coast sweet, loves East Coast hip hop. I pay attention to the way they hold hands. She brings him tea with one equal, one splendor, the way he likes it. At Thanksgiving that year, our whole family gathers at Malik's house. We are a loud and rowdy bunch. We meet David, Disha's son, for the first time. He's two years old and frightened by the noise, 
He hides his face in Malik's chest. Malik holds him close. We see for the first time, he's a dad. We fall in love with that little boy. Dear mom, today Malik is 11 months old. Yesterday he played baby Jesus in the manger. This is his first play. He slept almost through the entire thing. My friends Linrod and Lisa play Mary and Joseph. There is an actual old shed with real straw for the manger. I know we are growing something special here. Walt and Cheryl are proud parents. Once when Malik was four, his grandmother left him 35 cents to buy ice cream. When the ice cream truck rolled around, he was already in bed. Knowing how much he liked the music, I called him out of bed to see the truck. He wanted to go out and get some ice cream, but it was already late and past his bedtime. When the truck left, he stomped into his room, angry. I called out to him, asking for my goodnight hug. He did not answer. I called him again, still no answer. Finally, I said sternly, get in here. Did you hear mommy saying goodnight to you? He said, yes, but I don't speak to people who don't stop ice cream trucks. My grandmother left money for my ice cream and you let the truck go. I was stunned. There was no way to make it right. So I just hugged him and sent him to bed. Letter to dad from Malik in Trinidad. Dear dad, things are okay. I am playing a lot of small goal. I was in one fight with Desmond. I won, of course. If you see John, tell him I said hi. One of your tapes are messed up. The song Sunshine on side B is tangled with bad boy on side A. I wanna come home with mom because I hate Trinidad because of Mrs. Taylor. Love you, Malik. P.S. Please buy me a pair of Playboys for school. Black like the ones like yours. Bye-bye, Malik. August 27th, 1981. Dear mom, I made up 15 good songs. Love, Malik Taylor, age 10. Yellow Sourgrass. On the way to the burial, an embroidered lace of yellow oxalis dotted the highway median. The mountain in me grew higher, littered with snapshots of his face and the crude voice of Earth's sorrow. The first night after you left, I saw God's face and wept bitterly. The second night God offered a prayer. I screamed that prayer away. The third night God reached out his hand. I chewed on it until it became dust. On the fourth night, my tears became stone that filled in for eyes. Six months later, when they broke my heart open, there was not much, just clothes and blue leaves. I want to kiss my child again and again. The New Jersey ferry terminal where I last held his hand and memorized every holy road in the country of his beautiful face.
One sweet braid down she back. I want 30 more years of poems. I want tiger lily poems, orange blossom poems, mango poems, Lucille Clifton poems, and Suhir Hamad poems. Poems by Dion Brand and Joy Harjo. I want Grace Jones to sing she bumper song. Sweet and lawless. Don't care a damn what nobody feel. I want Jamaican yard talk poems. How I love that nanny of the maroons talk. Give me some Trini Bush poems, Spike with Vat 19 rum, and plenty blue hundred dollar bills. Lots and lots and lots of blue bills. So mommy, could just stay home and brush your hair and count bills and make frying fish and dumplings and count blue bills and make new babies with names like Tamarin and Flambeau, names like Righteous and Kneel and Pray, names like One Sweet Braid Down Shabbat, Names like Earth, Morning Star, and Inhabited. Poems to light white candles for good luck. Poems that blow kerosene and inspire rage. Poems to taunt the gods and almost get them vexed. Let mommy Let mommy cut oil drums to make steel pan and rock melodies until my dead twin brother come walking on shaven in the yard with Malik on his arm and say, oh, all right, all right, all you a home again, a done roaming, a home safe, a home. Now, what all you want me to do? And we light a big yard fire make pigtail pig soup and homemade Guinness stout ice cream. This time around, the girls gonna churn the ice and the boys gonna pour the salt. We go pray, sing for we dead. We go drink all oak rum, rub a little on the cherry gum. We go brew morby and sorrel and at 67, Granny go collect fresh blood and child bear again. Cheryl and mommy go get back the twins they lost. I want to kiss my son. I want to kiss my son and read every road in his beautiful face. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading. I want to just, I don't want to make a question out of this, but I do want to real quick say that it was such a joy for me to read the book and have it not be linear um, because it was my understanding. That's just like, that's not how mem memory isn't linear, you know, and so right. like the way that the way that the things in the book arrived to me felt um, so comfortable and so confidently arranged and so I'm so thankful for the book again and so thankful for that reading. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I knew I could write 60 sad poems, but <laughs> at that time I really could. But I wanted to, you know, bring in all the nuances and all the beauty. And I also knew that, you know, I lost Malik, yes, to an illness. How much harder it would be if I had lost him by a police or... So, you know, so there, there, I thought that there was nothing to be grateful for when I lost my son. But I found out that there was a lot of things to be grateful for. So thank you. And thanks to all the fans. <laughs>